My name is Kevin Mitnick. Kevin Mitnick hacked into the largest tech companies on the planet. I've successfully compromised all systems that I targeted for unauthorized access except one. Yet his greatest skill lay not in his technical ability, but in his deep understanding of human behavior, enabling him to manipulate people into doing things they wouldn't normally do. He'd walk into a building he was going to target, pretending to drop off a letter for an employee at the front desk, just so he could take a good look at the staff IDs. Then, using Photoshop, he'd forge his own ID. Kevin explained in his memoir, Ghost in the Wires, it doesn't even have to be all that authentic looking. 99% of the time, it won't get more than a glance. Wearing his fake badge, he'd follow employees back from smoke breaks through the back door, which required a security pass for access exploiting the common courtesy of holding the door open for the person behind you. He then let in his hacking buddy, who'd access the crawl space to get inside the locked office of the company's network engineers. Once inside, he bypassed the computer's existing operating system by installing a bootable version of it loaded with hacking tools, including malware that enabled him to access keystrokes, steal passwords, even activate the webcam. He eventually finds his way to the heart of the system, the servers responsible for handling customer transactions, and decrypts millions and millions of credit card numbers. I can make purchases all day long using a different credit card each time and never run out of numbers. Yet he never used any of the cards or any of the information he accessed. Like a kid breaking into an abandoned building, he hacked just for the fun of it. He explained, for us, the thrill lay simply in knowing we had gained the power. His obsession with exploiting the system started when he was young. At the age of 12, he found a way to ride the bus in LA for free by buying a punch card and punching blank tickets he fished out of a dumpster. Kevin spent a lot of time alone. His dad left when he was three, and his mom often worked double shifts as a waitress at various delis in Los Angeles to support them. To pass the time, he liked to perform magic tricks, influenced by the magician dad of the girl he had a crush on. He wrote, the notion that people enjoyed being taken in was a stunning revelation that influenced the course of my life. In high school, he became obsessed with phone freaking, manipulating telephone networks to make free long distance calls. He loved using technology to play pranks. He and his friend, Louis Depain would modify an amateur radio to make their voices come out of a McDonald's drive through speaker and say things like, I'm sorry, we don't serve cops here. But his antics were not always so innocent. When he was 17, he targeted the critical operating system of Pacific Bell, a major telephone provider in California later known as AT&T. Posing as an employee who wanted to show two friends around one night, the security guard simply said, sure, just sign in, without asking for ID. They walked out with piles of manuals on how the system worked. But then one of his buddy's ex-girlfriends snitched, and he spent three months in juvenile detention. That didn't deter him. His obsession with hacking overshadowed all else. He neglected high school, passed the GED exam, and later enrolled in a technical school in LA, where he met the woman who would later become his wife. Even when he moved in with Bonnie, he spent virtually every waking hour on his computer. One of his favorite targets was Digital Equipment Corporation, a leading computer vendor. He really wanted the source code, the recipe for how a product works, for DEC's new operating system, VMS, to identify security flaws. He and his friend, Lenny DeChico, remotely infiltrated DEC to steal the prized source code. But then Lenny betrayed him. When Lenny refused to fork over $150 after losing a bet, Kevin started calling Lenny's employer, pretending to be the IRS, and claiming Lenny was wanted for tax crimes. Lenny was so angry that he told his boss that he and Kevin were hacking into deck late at night from the office. The FBI got involved and Lenny started secretly recording his conversations with Kevin. When the feds arrested Kevin, Kevin said Lenny was dancing in a little circle of joy, as if he were celebrating some kind of victory over me. This hack would haunt him. Prosecutor Leon Weidman painted Kevin as a significant threat, claiming he can whistle into a telephone and launch a nuclear missile from NORAD. That might seem ridiculous now, but in the 1980s, there was a lot of fear over how technology worked. Computers and the fledgling internet were not that well understood by the general public. So the judge threw Kevin into solitary confinement, where he spent eight months. When he was ready for release, Bonnie left him. He suspected she was cheating. After hacking into her answering machine, he discovered that she was having an affair with his best friend, Lewis. 
Despite the betrayal, he remained friends with Lewis because there were very few people who could understand his predicament. After serving a year in prison, Kevin knew he had to tread more carefully. He needed to ensure his phone couldn't be tracked. He had to find a way of changing the electronic serial number of his Novatel PTR-825. He called Novatel and posed as one of their engineers, even calling from the noisy consumer electronics show in Las Vegas to sound credible. He spoke with an engineering manager named Kumamoto, who revealed it was possible to change the ESN from the phone's keypad if you had a special computer chip containing a special version of the firmware. Kevin convinced Kumamoto to ship a few chips to the Las Vegas hotel where he claimed to be staying. He then called up an electronics store and obtained the ESNs of recently activated phones, allowing him to impersonate those devices on the network. Around this time, Kevin was introduced to a supposed star hacker named Eric through his half-brother's ex-girlfriend. Eric was super secretive. He wouldn't give Kevin his phone number or pager number. They communicated through an intermediary. After talking a few times, Kevin's gut told him something was off. Eric didn't talk like other hackers. He sounded more like Joe Friday, like a cop. He asked questions like, what projects have you been up to lately? Who are you talking with these days? He decided to dig deeper into Eric's background. Kevin's friend Dave at Pacific Bell set up a trap with a bait phone number. When Eric dialed in, the call rerouted to Dave's office, allowing them to capture Eric's phone number through the system's caller ID. Using Eric's phone number, he discovered his address. He called Pacific Bell, pretending to be a technician named Terry. When asked for a tech code, Kevin provided a random number. He recalled, I knew she wasn't going to look it up. They never did. Any three-digit number would satisfy, so long as I sounded confident and didn't hesitate. Upon requesting the address linked to Eric's phone number, the employee didn't bat an eye. 3636 South Sepulveda, Unit 107B, registered under the name Joseph Werno. Kevin's doubts deepened when he accessed Eric's call logs and found calls to the Los Angeles headquarters of the FBI. Driven to unravel the full story, Kevin devised an elaborate scheme to obtain Eric's social security number. He posed as a member of the Office of the Inspector General at the Social Security Administration, responsible for investigating fraud. To gain credibility, he meticulously researched the agency's internal structure, the names of supervisors and managers, and even learned the company lingo, including terms like mods, short for modules, referring to teams handling claims. A staff member named Anne ate up his lies and gave him anything he wanted social security numbers, birth dates, benefits, earnings. Anne's information about an Eric Hines Sr., likely Eric's father, led to a shocking discovery. When Kevin called Eric Hines Sr. and said, I'm trying to get a hold of Eric, I'm a friend of his from high school. Eric Hines Sr. sounded annoyed and replied, my son died as an infant. Who really was the person masquerading as Eric Hines Jr.? Kevin remembered Eric bragging about collaborating with hacker Kevin Poulsen. He dug around and found an article about Poulsen conspiring with two others to rig radio contests. He recognized the name of one of the co-conspirators, but wasn't familiar with the other, Justin Tanner Peterson. When he manipulated the Department of Motor Vehicles to read in Peterson's physical description, it was a match for Eric. Justin Tanner Peterson was a hacker working as an FBI informant to save his own ass, in Kevin's words. The identity Joseph Wernell listed on the apartment was the made-up identity of an FBI agent named Joseph Waynes. Meanwhile, security at Pacific Bell had begun wiretapping calls from his father's house. In a lapse of judgment, Kevin had used his dad's landline while staying there temporarily instead of his untraceable cell phone. As the FBI pursued Kevin, he was also pursuing them. He figured out the names and numbers of the FBI agents Eric was talking to. And upon learning that the agents used the cell provider Pactel in Los Angeles, Kevin infiltrated Pactel's system to track their call records and pinpoint their locations. He also installed a scanner in his office at the private investigation firm where he worked to detect FBI cell phones using software programmed with numbers linked to Eric. In September 1992, Kevin's scanner detected the cell phone of FBI Special Agent Ken McGuire. He quickly cleaned up his apartment, ensuring there wasn't any evidence. On the morning of September 30, 1992, police knocked on his door. 
and he answered naked. The agents were also not pleased to find a box of FBI donuts waiting for them. Although the FBI found no evidence, his close calls with authorities were escalating. When Kevin conned the Department of Motor Vehicles into handing him a copy of Eric Hines' driver's license, DMV investigators tracked him to a print shop where Kevin's grandmother had driven him. The investigators chased him through the shop where he barely escaped. All the while, his poor grandmother waited in the parking lot for three hours, wondering what had happened to her grandson. Kevin later reflected, I never felt guilty about getting information I wasn't supposed to have. But when I thought about my grandmother, who had done so much for me and cared so much for me all my life, sitting there in her car for so long, waiting and anxious, I was filled with remorse. It was hard to leave his beloved grandma and mom, but he knew he had to go on the run. A warrant was out for his arrest for violating his probation by hacking and associating with other hackers. Kevin adopted a new identity, Eric Weiss, the real name of his hero, the magician Harry Houdini. He planned to do his own disappearing act. To solidify his persona, he infiltrated a credit reporting agency to find an Eric Weiss with good credit and around his age. Then he got help from Anne, his friendly contact at the Social Security Administration to gather other personal details about Eric. He moved to Denver with his new identity, drawn by the allure of its natural beauty, and got a gig in the IT department of a prominent law firm, where he worked by day and hacked by night. The fun lay in hacking the world's largest tech companies with presumably the best security. He set his sights on obtaining the source code for one of Motorola's coolest phones, the MicroTAC Ultra Lite. He wanted to understand how the phone software worked to try to change the ESN, just as he had done with his Novatel phone. Posing as Rick from Motorola's research and development team in Illinois, he got Alyssa on the phone, a stand-in for Pam, an assistant to a VP in R&D who was on vacation. He deceived Alyssa by saying that Pam was supposed to send him the source code for the MicroTag Ultralight, but had directed him to Alyssa if she couldn't send it before her holiday. When Alyssa asked, what version do you want? Kevin had no clue what to ask for and said, how about the latest and greatest? Just like that, Alyssa handed him one of Motorola's most protected trade secrets. Though there was one little hiccup. Kevin had forgotten to acquire the compiler to translate the source code into machine-readable code. Still, it was a thrill. Next came Nokia. He posed as an engineer from Nokia USA in San Diego and contacted one of Nokia's offices in Finland, where a guy named Tapio transferred the source code for the Nokia 121 via FTP. Surprised by how easy that was, Kevin wondered if he could infiltrate Nokia's internal network to access more source codes and information on upcoming releases. He deceived Nokia England's IT department into giving him the login details to connect to its operating system, which he exploited to gain full system access and create a new user account for himself. Then he set his sights on a secretive digital phone under development, internally called the HD760. He contacted the lead developer, Marku, persuading him to share the latest source code. However, Nokia blocked outbound file transfers for security reasons, following alerts triggered when Kevin created his new account. Unfazed, he persuaded Marku to ship the source code via a tape drive to a Nokia office in Florida. His friend Lewis would impersonate the senior vice president of Nokia USA to retrieve the tape, as it was too risky for Kevin to go. The package was arranged to be picked up at a Ramada Inn near the Nokia office, but the FBI had already been alerted. Kevin became suspicious when he called the hotel to confirm the pickup, and the receptionist seemed nervous and put him on hold for several minutes. Kevin called back later, pretending to be an FBI agent. This is Special Agent Wilson with the FBI. Are you familiar with the situation on your premises? The manager responded, of course I am. The police have the whole place under surveillance. It was time to leave and become someone else. He settled on Seattle because of its tech scene, Thai food, and good coffee. He adopted the identity of a baby who died, Brian Merrill, which he obtained by posing as a private investigator at South Dakota's State Registrar for Vital Statistics. He had to be extremely careful about hiding his real identity. The front page of the New York Times labeled him Cyberspace's Most Wanted. Kevin felt journalist John Markoff had wrongly turned him into a supervillain. The article was right about one thing. Kevin was eluding the FBI. 
Special Agent Kathleen Carson confirmed as much in a letter to a British computer expert Kevin had been in contact with. The letter read, in part, I do not believe we will ever be able to find him via his telephone traces, telnet, or FTP connections. Your assistance is crucial to this investigation. The crucial assistance the FBI received actually came from Tutomu Shimamura, known as Shimi, one of America's most skilled computer security experts. Shimi joined the FBI manhunt because he was furious that Kevin had hacked into his system. At the time, Shimi and hacker Mark Latour were working on a special project involving the OK900 cell phone. They had reverse engineered it, allowing them to change the ESN via the keypad. Eager to learn more, Kevin hacked into Shimmy's server and managed to steal files from his home computer. Shimmy was furious when he discovered the intrusion using network monitoring tools. Kevin wrote in his memoirs, I had unleashed a hacker vigilante who would stop at nothing to get even with me. The high of hacking into Shimmy's server was short-lived. Police armed with a search warrant entered Kevin's home when he wasn't there and seized his electronics. They were not the FBI, but local cops who were looking into his alias, Brian Merrill. Still, it was only a matter of time before the different agencies talked. He fled Seattle for yet another fresh start, relocating to Raleigh, North Carolina. He was now Michael David Stanfill, an identity he acquired after infiltrating the admissions office of Portland State University and accessing more than 13,000 student records. Remember when he hacked into Motorola and obtained the source code without securing the needed compiler? He now manipulated an engineer named Marty from Motorola's compiler supplier to FTP the file to him. Marty mentioned that the FBI was tracking a super hacker that they figured would try to acquire the compiler. Little did he know he was talking to that very super hacker. High from this latest stunt, Kevin woke up one day to find his cell phone dead. His service provider disconnected it because the real Michael Stanfill had reported identity theft. The ruse unraveled when Kevin attempted to avoid paying a $400 deposit for new electricity customers by requesting a reference letter from Michael's utility company. Unfortunately for him, the letter was also faxed to the real Michael's address, exposing the fraud. With his deception discovered, Kevin chose another alias from the thousands he accessed from Portland State University, G. Thomas Case. The feds were closing in on him and they were about to get a lucky break. Kevin had stored the files he grabbed from Shimmy's server on a community forum called The Well. However, The Well had an automated alert system that notified users when they used a significant amount of disk space. One day, Bruce Koble received an email indicating that his account for an event he was organizing was using 150 megabytes of storage on the Well's servers, which was a substantial amount at the time. Bruce discovered that the stored files didn't belong to him. They contained emails addressed to Totomu's work email. They were the stash of files stolen from Shimmy's computer. When Kevin tried to figure out how much the feds knew about him by hacking into journalist John Markoff's emails, Shimmy was watching his every move. Internet service providers granted Shimmy full access to their networks. By cross-referencing instances of unauthorized access to the well with the login and logout records from the internet service provider Netcom, Shimmy found a pattern. One account accessed the well through Netcom's dial-up modems in Denver and Raleigh. Shimmy's team traced the call in real time to Sprint's cellular network. However, Kevin had manipulated the system to use a phone number that wasn't assigned to any customer but still appeared to be legitimate. So a Sprint engineer cleverly focused on calls placed to the manipulated number rather than from it, leading to a Raleigh area code. These connection attempts consistently utilized the same cell phone tower, indicating that the phone Kevin used to connect to the internet was in a fixed location. Shimmy hopped on a plane to Raleigh. Kevin's attempt to connect to Netcom through a different cell phone provider as a precaution was in vain. All cell phone companies were on the alert for any strange activity, immediately relaying it to Shimmy. When a suspicious data call was underway, Shimmy and his team jumped into a vehicle and used a radio direction finding device to try to pinpoint the source of the cellular radio signal, leading them to Kevin's neighborhood. When they intercepted a conversation between Kevin and another hacker, journalist John Markoff, who joined the pursuit, recognized his voice and shouted, it's him, it's Mitnick. After finishing up at the gym, Kevin went home and logged onto his computer a little after midnight on February 15, 1995. 
He noticed several of the back doors he had been using to access various systems had unexpectedly vanished. He had a sinking feeling in his stomach that something bad was about to happen. So he looked out into his apartment corridor, which gave a view of the parking lot, to see if he was being watched. A U.S. Marshal caught a glimpse of him. At 1.30 a.m., Kevin got a knock on the door. Who is it? He yelled. FBI. After nearly three years of hiding, they finally caught him. When Kevin passed Shimmy in court, he said, I respect your skills, and nodded. Shimmy returned the nod. Kevin was tossed into solitary confinement, his greatest fear. He tried to get out on bail, but the judge denied him a bail hearing. At first, he and his lawyer weren't allowed to examine the electronic evidence against him, as the judge feared he'd unleash a destructive computer virus. Due to the harshness of how he was being treated, a community of supporters banded together and started the Free Kevin movement. When Kevin saw the outpouring of support, it moved him. It meant the world to me that there was an army of people working tirelessly to support me. It gave me more hope and courage than they could ever know. Prosecutors alleged that he caused $300 million in damages based on the value of the source code, which included development costs. Kevin thought that was ridiculous and likened it to nabbing someone for stealing a can of Coke and demanding that he repay the cost of developing Coca-Cola's secret formula. He argued that damages should reflect the value of the source code license, which he estimated to be under $10,000. Ultimately, he was ordered to pay $4,125, factoring in his ability to pay. He wasn't exactly wealthy. He had never used or sold any of the information he accessed. Kevin pleaded guilty to seven counts, including wire fraud, computer fraud, possession of access devices, and interception of data communications. He served five years in prison. When he was released on January 21, 2000, he said, my case is a case of curiosity. Uh, Mr. Mitnick, thank you for being with us here today. After his release, his former adversary, the U.S. government, invited him to share his insights. The human side of computer security is easily exploited and constantly overlooked. Companies spend millions of dollars on firewalls, encryption, and secure access devices, and it's money wasted because none of these measures address the weakest link in the security chain. The people who use, administer, operate, and account for computer systems that contain protected information. Kevin became hugely sought after. Now, Kevin Mitnick is the world's most famous hacker. Kevin Mitnick is a security consultant and CEO of Mitnick Security. He used his hacking skills ethically by advising companies on strengthening their security and also shared helpful everyday advice. Zero, 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 zero. And voila. Stay safe. Don't trust the safes. Kevin had created a new life for himself and found love again, marrying Kimberly, whom he met at a cybersecurity conference in Singapore. But his happiness would be cut short. In 2022, Kevin received the devastating news that he had pancreatic cancer, which he battled for 14 months. On July 16, 2023, Kevin Mitnick died peacefully. He was 59 years old. At the time of his passing, his wife was pregnant. Kimberly later expressed, Our son will know you, and I am convinced he will be a mini-you. Kevin Mitnick went from being the world's most wanted hacker to the world's most wanted security expert. His insights have changed how companies and individuals protect their most sensitive data. As Kevin reflected on his remarkable journey, he said it was just like magic. While Kevin never used any of the information he accessed, the reality is not everyone out there would do the same. In 2023, Americans lost $10 billion to fraud, with imposter scams topping the list according to the FTC. And if you've ever Googled your name or email, as I have, you'll be shocked to see just how much information is out there about you. And unfortunately, data brokers sell your information to scammers, spammers, or anyone looking to exploit you. That's why I'm really excited to be partnering with Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura is on a mission to protect you online. Aura shows you which data brokers are selling your information and automatically submits opt-out requests for you. This doesn't just cut down on spam, but protects you from hackers trying to access your social media, bank accounts, and other sensitive information. 
beyond safeguarding your information from data brokers, Aura includes a credit monitoring service where you can monitor your credit and get fraud alerts, as well as a password manager, antivirus protection, and a VPN, all without having to download several different apps. It's the best of everything at an affordable price. Aura is free for you to try out for two weeks by signing up at my custom link, aura.com slash newsthink. That's aura.com slash newsthink. The link is in my description. Thanks for watching. For Newsthink, I'm Cindy Palm.